All right. That's actually... I, I, have, I, have a, I have a sound effect ready. Oh. <laughs> nice. Okay, for what? Oh no. <laughs> the timing! Most sequels these days tend to either be reimaginings of how the previous game played, or just the same experience with some refinements and cutting away the fat that even remotely rubbed people the wrong way. Remnant 2 does neither by building directly off the first game. Really, Remnant 2 does almost nothing actually new from the original. In its place, it expanded upon and refined nearly every last aspect of what Remnant from the Ashes did. It's like they were so confident in the first game that instead of trying to remove some weaker parts or rework features, they wanted to do everything the exact same way, but better. So most of what I say here also applies to the first game to some extent. So if it sounds interesting, I'd also recommend trying that first game out as well. Remnant is a third-person shooter that is heavily inspired by Dark Souls. Made more than apparent by the checkpoint system that regenerates healing resources and respawns enemies, it's large and heavily telegraphed enemies and bosses, and they even make a near one-to-one -one copy of the contextual combo mechanics of Dark Souls. But where the series differentiates itself from all the other attempts is that it also has really solid shooting mechanics. In fact, the game doesn't try to limit itself to being melee-focused, and they are fine with introducing enemies that can't be reasonably hit with your melee attacks, meaning you will be regularly using guns. Thankfully, due to that, melee is actually pretty good when you do get to use it. Another unique feature is that Remnant uses a lot of procedurally generated levels. The main overworld portions of each planet are linear but branching levels made out of tiles that guide you to the dungeons that line the place. The dungeons that appear are also random. You can't see every dungeon or event in a single playthrough because there are more encounters available than you will be able to see in one go. Some of the dungeons and events can tie in with other events or secrets to unlock more rewards if you're observant enough. Unlike a couple points in Remnant 1, if a dungeon or event needs an item from another location, then that location will always spawn. Now, I can understand the idea of using tiles might sound a bit sketchy over pre-made levels. However, I found that the tiles used were big enough and flowed well enough that in some cases, I couldn't really tell when one tile began and another ended, though at times they were definitely noticeable. But overall, I did find myself quite impressed with how large the levels were, while also being fun to navigate. Now to go into more detail on how this game actually plays, beyond just calling it the Dark Souls of third-person shooters. When it comes to guns, it's mostly what you expect, but with a few fun twists. A number of guns have different firing mechanics associated with them, be it ricocheting bullets, requiring a charge, or increasing accuracy when you fire them. The boss weapons in particular all feature wild mechanics that make these guns way more interesting to use rather than just adding another flavor of machine gun or pistol. And a great touch that Remnant 1 struggled with is that rolling doesn't interrupt reloads and sitting at a checkpoint now restores all your ammo too. Nothing says creativity like a gun named the Cube Gun, which fires up to five boomerang cubes, allowing it to have infinite ammo, meaning it's only restricted by the range you engage at and its heat level. This weapon also comes with a mod to create a ranged damage shield that can also be fired out to deal damage and push away melee enemies. They really go hard on a lot of these weapons. For melee and general movement, the basic mechanics are quite similar. You have a stamina system that depletes when sprinting, dodging, and doing heavy attacks, but thankfully it only stops regenerating when using melee rather than every swing consuming stamina because this game can get pretty aggressive. Melee can be performed at any point when hitting the attack button so long as you aren't aiming, meaning hip firing guns is not possible. So unless you're a crack shot, it's best to keep distance when using guns. Melee combos are straightforward. You have lights and heavies triggered by clicking or holding the attack button, sprinting attacks that come out quicker, and backstep attacks that have a good gap closer so you can stick to enemies better. Interestingly, unlike any game I've seen ape this style of combat, it also adds a heavy backstep option. Beats me why they felt it was necessary, but it looks sick and comes in handy since the backstep is a very handy tool for melee due to the shorter recovery. Melee attacks are also quite useful for a number of reasons beyond just being sick as hell. They have a really high stagger, meaning many enemies can get flinched with strong attacks, and they generate mod power for both your weapons and can have special modifiers equipped that further help them synergize with using guns or just make the melee itself better. Mods are special powers you can equip on guns, they generate primarily by landing hits with the given weapon, and these effects range from long-lasting damage buffs, a huge burst of damage, or creating temporary summons. There's a huge variety in effects that can help whatever build you're going for, or even define it based on the equipment you have. These mods are also freely interchangeable between standard weapons, and in a stroke of absolute genius, every standard weapon has four to five unique appearances based on the type of mod equipped. Want a baller-looking scrap M249 saw? How about turning this into some funky alien blaster, or maybe even turning it into some ornate space elf light machine gun. Admittedly, 
Some looks aren't as detailed and make it obvious that they just slapped random crap around the gun rather than changing the silhouette noticeably, but the fact this is in the game in the first place makes me incredibly happy because it must have been a lot of work. Using your weapons isn't the only way to generate mod power though. This game has a very powerful customization system that's spread out between a number of slots that allow you to enhance pretty much every mechanic. You have a single powerful amulet slot, four ring slots, a mutator slot on each of your melee and range weapons, three relic slots on your healing relic for minor stat boosts, and in the biggest twist I never expected, you can even swap out your reliable and consistent healing relic. Your options are anything from rewarding preemptive healing to something that actively hurts you in order to generate another resource. Going back to mod generation, however, for a while I would use a relic that gave me life regeneration and mod power regeneration, a ring that would heal me over time when I used mods, another ring that would reduce the mod cost but upon activation turn a portion of my health into recoverable grey health, meaning that I was constantly regenerating health. This was topped off with a ring that regenerates 200% of health I recover as mod power. This allows me to use mods a fair bit more, especially in my offhand weapon since I didn't use it as much. The last part of customizing your builds are the archetypes. Archetypes offer the most build-defining boosts by far. Remnant 1's classes were more akin to Dark Souls. They dictated your starting gear with set bonuses, starting stat bonuses, and even gave you a unique trait to level up. But beyond that, nothing stopped you from stepping on someone else's toes and doing something else. Remnant 2, however, no longer has set bonuses. Instead, every class is an actual class. They get a prime perk which helps define the playstyle, four smaller perks you unlock and upgrade as you level, and three abilities to pick from, with only one being equipable at a time. There are four classes to pick from at the start, two DPS and two support. Challenger is the close range god who can show death who the head bitch in charge is by standing right back up with full health after taking a lethal hit. Hunter is the opposite end, where he gets more range, and by landing headshots can keep his buff abilities going for huge lengths of time. For support, you have Handler, who can control a dog that can either tank damage, deal damage, or heal people, while also buffing their damage reduction, damage bonus, and move speed in their respective modes. They can also create a lot of breathing room and leniency by being able to use the dog to revive fallen allies or even yourself. Field Medic is the classic heal bot. This man can shit out so many different forms of healing that they also decided to make the prime perk regenerating your healing relic charges by just healing, meaning you have a ton of extra room to work with. As if his base healing wasn't already cracked, he also gets the best trait in the game, which increases almost every source of healing by quite a bit. Thankfully, the innate trait for every class can be unlocked and used on any other class once you reach level 10 in that class, which means Yes, you can not only change class on the fly, but you can also multi-class, where you use a primary class and everything but the prime perk of the secondary class. This game also does something that I've never really seen any game with class combinations pulls off. Well, say for two made by the same company, Grim Dawn and Titan's Quest. When you equip two classes together, you get a unique combination name where the first part is the primary class's prime perk, and the second part is the combination of the two classes, such as Hunter and Handler getting the name Predator, and Challenger Medic getting Guardian. I live for shit like this. And an interesting thing about the classes is that while the game feels perfectly fine in single player, it also feels like they took into account multiplayer rather than just throwing in an extra player, scaling up the HP and damage and calling it a day. Things feel like they were actually made to consider having that extra person. Every skill and perk works fine on its own, but it may or may not have a bonus that considers multiplayer, such as Medic's Redemption being a huge charged heal capable of regenerating your entire life bar in seconds for all 10 whole seconds, but it can also be charged up to revive everyone. Or the Challenger's perks that allow you to reduce the damage of everything near you when you use an ability. This indirectly lets you keep allies safe if a ranged enemy decides to shift aggro onto someone else. There's a ton more details here and there, like everyone having their own animations as background characters in cutscenes, and there being small dialogue between the characters after certain events or bosses. It makes the presence of the people you play with feel known, rather than just a group of three silent dudes running around shooting the same targets. And the other reason player presence is punctuated is the inclusion of friendly fire. There's a lot of fancy AoE effects in this game that do a ton of damage, but with friendly fire you have to be very considerate about where you use them since they can heavily chunk players. But this isn't entirely a negative. You can do some really stupid shit like applying status effects to your friends to trigger any buffs they have, or to just use them as a DPS dummy. Nothing says friendship like telling the 50th hand related pun and getting removed from this mortal coil by your best friend. Why did you explode on me, Matt? <laughs> Fuck you. Hurt <laughs> you more than it hurt me? I know it did, but it's not about hurting you, it's about the message. <laughs> the, the message is I just feel kind of bad now, so you know what the congratulations message said.
Thank you for that backhanded compliment. <laughs> I hit him down outside his I just see. I fucking knew it's all my balls. <laughs> and because of that, it's not just a dumb, fun co op shooter that happens to be your really solid multiplayer experience. Teamwork becomes pretty important due to the massively increased damage for having a full party. Prior to a major patch, a full lobby on Veteran did almost as much damage as Solo Apocalypse. You know, the highest difficulty in the game, that requires you to beat the game first. Thankfully, the damage increase for a full group went from 50% increase to 30%, which should make it more manageable since you would get killed in 1-3 to three hits prior. So because of that high damage, having someone who can soak up a few extra hits and power through damage to get revives off like Challenger, someone who can reliably revive with either Medic or Handler, and someone who could just stand back and unleash DPS gives everyone so much more breathing room that it felt pretty satisfying to work together. That isn't necessarily saying that the co-op mechanics are particularly deep, but when compared to its contemporaries, I found that this game is a lot more engaging to play with my friends. As mentioned earlier, levels are procedurally generated, and what dungeons, events, and even loot you find on bodies can be random from a pool made specifically for the area. This is great for replayability since any singular run is satisfying on its own, however, it does go a step further. There are even alternate stories for the places you visit. At first, when you enter a world, you're greeted right away with a big set piece or character that set the stage for how the rest of the world will play out. For example, on the planet Losum, you will either start in the slums of Elf London, or you'll start in front of a giant gilded gothic castle. Starting in the slums mean you'll be spending most of your time there and work your way into the castle, whereas starting in the castle means you'll spend most of your time there and then work your way into the slums. Each different opening also indicates which final boss you'll encounter. And to facilitate all this, the story is very open-ended. You're dealing with a big threat and just have to go places to kill big things. So the order is purposely vague, allowing for any of the worlds to act as the first one you visit, meaning you can experience everything in a different order each time you play. And as if that wasn't enough, it seems secrets within the dungeons can be random as well. Paired with loot being a sign from a giant area pool, you can't really ignore a dungeon just because you've been there once already. That might sound daunting to have to replay the game over and over so many times to see and get everything, but the game does try to make it as easy as possible. Originally, Remnant 1 had very limited ways of dealing with this problem, but got better with updates. Remnant 2 significantly fixes this problem by immediately giving you the opportunity to reroll the campaign. Then, once you beat the world, you unlock Adventure Mode for it. Adventure mode is just re-rolling that world and that world alone, separate from the rest of the campaign. So, if you want to keep redoing a world for the specific boss or event, you can do so without having to reset your whole campaign. And speaking of those bosses, they are impeccable. Remnant 1 was very back and forth with bosses. Some felt like they were just dangerous background entities that backed up a constant flow of minions, since so many bosses either had minion phases or were just an endless flow of them, or the bosses felt a little too bootleg Dark Souls. Overall, I enjoyed Remnant 1's bosses, but they were one of the biggest points of contention for people that I saw. However, Remnant 2 does a complete 180 and makes every boss at the very least conceptually super interesting. They are all incredibly engaging set pieces at the bare minimum, their attack patterns are almost all well telegraphed and feel fair, and many of them go beyond just boss does attack, try and iframe it by introducing fight gimmicks. One of my favorites, and possibly my favorite boss in any video game period, is a boss that tells you shifting sandlands from Mario 64 clearly gave one of the devs nightmares as a kid. Oh, I've played a game like this before. I forgot what the name of it though. Oh god! Oh god! Oh god! Where's the- It's the sand- It's the sand it's the sand, the sand desert! <laughs> <laughs> there are no bad bosses in my eyes. I have had problems with a few, and they definitely got a bit frustrating, primarily because they would have too much going on at once, or had a bit too much damage, but even with that, they were still very fun bosses across the board. There are some bosses that are just red phantom versions of large enemies with a few modifiers, but those fights are a lot shorter, and I don't really consider them to be on the same level just because they have a big fancy health bar. But for as much as I love the bosses, there is one thing that easily takes the cake. The exploration. This game is unfathomably dense with secrets and alternate choices. I don't just mean secrets like Doom or Serious Sam where you dry hump a random wall or try and get out of bounds, though that does exist in small doses. Remnant 1 had its fair share of secrets, don't get me wrong, 
but they were way more spread out and in some instances, a possible outcome wouldn't even be achievable in one run because the dungeon you needed just wasn't there. Remnant 2 on the other hand goes so far into crazy well hidden, but mostly logical secret hunting, that it feels not only doable to get nearly everything on my own as a certified moron, but also makes Remnant 2 feel more like a puzzle game at times. So this is where I will drop a fat spoiler warning. To me, the discovery was a massive part of this game. Thinking of every alternate path, every secret, or event is the one thing I enjoyed the most. So from this point on, I will be bringing up a few examples and going into details here and there. But this will be the main book of the secret talk, so skip to here if you want to avoid it. There was one seemingly innocent and short dungeon with a nice reward at the end. However, this reward, named Andaria's Endless Loop, was no doubt a hint at what's to come. This small dungeon, as it turns out, has several secrets hidden within it. First, there was a locked door we couldn't figure out how to open. After much searching, we found a stone plate in the final room that opens up a door to a grid maze where you have to stand on buttons to open doors to nearby areas and figure out how to get everything and get out. When you leave the maze, you could just go back to the checkpoint past the dropdown. However, there is a secret within a secret here. In that final room before the drop down, there is an illusory wall. Because apparently those are a fucking thing in this game, and going through it gets you another item. That's not all. There's two more illusory walls in that dungeon, and are thankfully more obvious to find once we know that fake walls exist. But it doesn't end there though. Remember that door we mentioned? We never opened it. Turns out, the pressure plate to open the maze also opens up the wall right next to that door but only for a moment, meaning you cannot complete this puzzle without it being in multiplayer. So yes, there are in fact multiplayer-only puzzles in this game. Very few from what I have seen, and thankfully, the rewards are geared only for multiplayer. As in, if you're alone, they do nothing for you. Which is a really nice way to soften the blow of driving you nuts after showing you a door that a solo player could never open. In the end, this one small dungeon was so full of puzzles, it alone ate up over an hour of me and my friend's time racking our brains trying to figure out this shit. By the end of that hour, and discovering that there are multiplayer puzzles, we were just broken. We survive speed and relic consume speed, okay, yeah. It's pretty good, it's pretty good. But it's only when, it's people, it's only when people are down. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's pretty increases, good. Increases it's pretty good. Increases speed when it's people are down. That's yeah, pretty, good. Right. Pretty, good, pretty, yeah. pretty good. It's pretty good, yeah. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. We're delirious. <laughs> and when it comes to random events, some shit just comes out of left field. You can walk around one planet and suddenly you'll encounter a dummy thick fairy who asks you philosophical questions about moral conundrums and other big words I can put together. She paints a detailed picture of a situation and provides you with options and it's up to you to select what you feel you would do. Based on your answers, you are awarded with one new trait and there's up to three different traits you can receive, but only once per run of the world. It's not entirely a puzzle beyond figuring out what to say to get all three trait cards, but the fact that something like this exists in an over-the-top action shooter is so jarring that I love it. Especially because this, as well as the rest of the game, is so well written, I found it really engaging. Really, the fact that this game regularly makes you stop and think instead of endlessly fueling the dopamine receptors in your brain that go ping when you see your big red damage number on an enemy and a corpse is such a breath of fresh air, especially for a shooter. However, not all secrets are stuff you'd expect the average person to figure out. One of the heaviest armors in the game is hidden behind a secret within a secret. In the labyrinth, instead of going through this specific portal, you can go behind it and jump off the ledge into a random portal below. This portal takes you to an area that seemingly has nothing on it. However, if you decide to randomly climb on shit, you'll find that you can parkour your way up the wall and into a small crawl space that eventually leads you to a door, which takes you to a blocked off room that you can see from another secret found in Ward 13. This armor is so heavy that instead of rolling, you achieve what is called the flop. Yes, that's actually what it's called. Oh, and guess what? If you flop 100 times, an NPC will sell you a very good amulet. Also, the flop does damage. That's all. And another secret that I had pointed out to me that I never would have figured out on my own, this seemingly innocent little jumping puzzle over a big chasm. As you're taking out all the slugs, you'll notice one of them is blocking a pipe. When you kill it, the pipe starts flooding out water. 
You could stand around trying to figure out what that accomplished, but ultimately it might not see anything and then leave. Turns out, if you wait 90 real-world minutes, the entire thing fills up with water, you can jump on these floating boards, and then get a fucking rocket launcher. That one's a little bit more on the sensible side, but the fact that it can take so long means some people will just forget to come back. I really can't make this shit up. Remnant secrets are absolutely insane at times. And to top it all off, they even went so far as to add a secret you can only get through data mining. They made a class require a specific piece of equipment in every slot, which can require their own puzzles in order to get. To give you a reference for how crazy this is, just the healing relic requires you to roll a specific world boss on one of the planets, turn in the quest item, and then wait 24 real world hours before coming back to the zone you already completed. Granted, you could just set your system clock ahead. These secrets and the way everything has been randomized has led to such an interesting experience. While we all played through this game once together, me and my friends started doing mini runs of certain areas to get stuff we might need, leading to our group chat being flooded with all the cool shit and alternate paths we discovered. It feels like we're kids meeting together at the playground talking about cool video game rumors again. Like, that's not even an exaggeration. I just rolled up to our chat, said, Hey guys, remember this clown? If you do the clap emote at him, you get an amulet, and everyone just lost their shit. It has been a long time since a game made me feel anything close to this level of personal and shared discovery, and no doubt, if items in dungeons were a lot more fixed, it would just be too tempting to look up where everything is after a single playthrough to complete whatever build it is we intend to do. And in the same vein of secrets, this game really has a lot of small details that truly show the level of care placed into it. Things like the dog having unique animations for putting out fire status effects or getting out of water. This one specific enemy who plays a special death animation if you headshot him while they're performing some specific actions. Or this specific boss that tries to fight you while retreating through an entire zone. However, if you decide to fuck off and do a dungeon along the way, you can find that boss sleeping near the end of the zone, letting you get a big surprise attack on them. And there's so much more if you keep an eye out. Normally, it's around this time of the video I talk about the things I didn't really like. But other than some of the complaints leveled previously, there's very little. The only three things that put any sort of dent in my enjoyment of this game is the performance, how boring the story was, and how tight money was. Performance is overall not good. Most of the time I could maintain 55 to 60 FPS with my 3060 and 5600X, however, in some zones without any combat going on, it has dropped down to the 40s. Even after a patch, it's not improved much for me. Then there's the story. Remnant 1's story wasn't particularly exciting either, but it had a lot more long-term personal goals and a better build-up that I found myself interested in what's going on next. Remnant 2 just jumps right into the deep end with no build-up and gives you such a broad goal that I felt disconnected from the story up until the end. That said, the individual stories on each world and the lore surrounding them is fantastic, but even that was somewhat sparse until you reached the three or four story beats per run. It made the game feel less like an intergalactic epic to fight off an existential threat, and more like a theme park. Lastly, money's tight. After traveling through a few zones, killing and looting everything in sight, I managed to only get about 4,000 scrap. Which isn't much. You have three weapons to upgrade, each weapon can have their own mutators you can upgrade, you can turn boss items into mods or new weapons, which can also be upgraded, and then there's your healing relic and new classes. It's a lot to keep up, and whenever I returned, I'd only be able to afford three upgrades at most. It got to the point where I had to forego upgrading my healing relic and mutators, because I made a few too many boss mods and tried some new weapons I found. Not like I needed the healing relics, since we'd just die in one to two hits anyways. If you want to not have much money troubles, you could just farm a planet in adventure mode since it auto-sells duplicate equipment, but if you're just playing the game from start to end, it can be rough. They did make improvements since launch, but it's still not quite there yet. I can now afford upgrades a bit more regularly, but when you consider there's also an entire slew of consumables I just don't feel like I have the finances to use on a semi-regular basis, there's still some room to improve. Beyond that, I really have very little problems with this game. Hell, it's even incredibly bug-free, and any bugs we did find were humorous at worst. I managed to become immune to the suicide warp item, a friend managed to lag and slide around at high speeds shooting in a downstate, and we found a puzzle that broke, leading to an infinite money glitch. If you shoot this corpse, you get a hand. 
When you finish the objective, you get an item, but if you don't complete the objective, the corpse will just keep dropping hands every time it's shot, allowing you to turn in each and every copy for a duplicate of the item, resulting in shitloads of cash. When the worst bugs you've seen cause your group to devolve into laughter and endless puns, you know you did something right. <laughs> I gotta hand it to ya! <laughs> All hands on deck! <laughs> I can't put my finger on it, but I think we really got a hand to this situation. I don't know why. There's so many, there's so many hands here. It's hard to navigate them. It's a good thing we have an index. Dude, we can just palm these off. I know, I knew I was dealing out knuckle sandwiches, but this is ridiculous. Uh, no, it's it's 250 scrap per hand. Yo, dude, we are making mad digits. Nuts. Talk about a oh. five finger discount, man. <laughs> You know, we 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 made some we made so much money off this. It's a pretty lucrative hand job. I <laughs> I'm dead. So that's Remnant 2. It's really hard to sum up my thoughts without sounding too flowery or blowing smoke up this game's ass, but coming from the high of beating this game and replaying chunks of it over and over both solo and with friends, this is easily one of the most enjoyable games I have ever played. Period. It's so refreshing to have a game that is very little in the way of random bullshit, absolutely dense with mentally straining puzzles and exploration, and manages to wrap itself up nicely with a fantastic amount of variety in nearly every respect. I've played this game 50 hours on and off stream. I played more to get specific footage. I played even more to be a completionist. Now that this video is done, I will be playing even more Remnant, which isn't something I always do after I make a video. I am fully down for that remnancy. Now please give me Darksiders full- Is there actually anything more down there? Why would there not be? It's Remnant 2. I found a rock in my shoe, and then I took the rock, I cracked it against the, uh, the thing, I found another rock that was inside that rock, and then I threw that rock that against rock the window, and then Great the window turned into a giant rock. crab. I had to fight the crab boss fight in my own living room, and then after I fought the crab boss fight, it gave me a lobster token that I went to Red Lobster, and then I had okay. to fight the you management the staff. <laughs> so I, had to, I had to fight the manager, but, I, but, if I asked, but if I asked for the extra side cup of butter, he would let me pass, and then I would go to the back kitchen and they give me a paper crown that gives me 2.4 times more damage if I if I if I'm full on red lobster